Welcome to another edition of the Mexican Soccer Show. I'm Wiso from FoodMexSource.com. This is an hour-long podcast dedicated to all things Mexican football. Lots and lots to talk about today, Monday, a couple of days after Mexico and Argentina. But first, I'm hearing the sirens. I'm hearing the uh, all the bells going off. Lots of whistles there because we have some break and breaking news that just happened a couple of uh, uh, moments ago with uh, Chivas. So, you know, right away, before we even say hi to everyone, before we even say hi to Mr. Tom Marshall and Naive Moran, these are big, big news. And La Torre, the De La Torres brothers are gone. Tom, we're going straight to you because you're in Guadalajara. What's going on before we even say hi? Chivas, Chivas, Chivas on a Monday, which we thought was going to be just a normal Monday after Liga MX, after the Mexico games. But here we are. Tom, take it away. Well, you know, <laughs> Chivas lost 2 1 on Friday to Club T1. And, uh, you know, I think they're on, what, seven points from eight games in the table. And then all of a sudden today, well, last night, um, Almeida, Mateas Almeida, Argentine coach who, who got promotion with River Plate. That's what he's most famous for as a manager. And all of a sudden he turns up in Guadalajara. And he's like, yeah, um, you know, I'm in talks to be the Chivas coach. And everyone's <laughs> like, well, Chivas have got a coach. And, and then. The next day, Chepo turns up for work, and basically, he gets fired, and that's how it works. Oh, man, the circus of the FMF, we're finding out from other coaches, never them, and kind of like the, the Tuca from Tigres, you know, pointing out that, they're, that, that Tuca was going to be part of El Tri. feels like there's not that connection. They really need to get their links. Naive, Chivas uh, de la Torre, to you. It was it was a coming. I know everyone was kind of talking over the weekend, especially with the loss, but at the same time, uh, the circus keeps on. The continuation, you know, of of these coaches and and what's happening with Regatta. Your take? Yeah, yeah. First of all, uh, hello, uh, we saw hello, uh, Tom. Hope you're having a good night to the audience as well. Um, it's interesting because uh, it all started Saturday in Argentina with uh, this journalist uh, Hernan Castillo uh, from uh, the network Fox Sports, and he tweeted out that Almeida was heading to Guadalajara to coach Chivas. Over there in Argentina, they were already saying that Matias Almeida was going to go to Chivas to be the new Chivas, uh, be the new Chivas coach in Guadalajara. And, and in Guadalajara, there was no clue that this was happening. You know, it just happened all of a sudden on Sunday. Almeida came with three big suitcases with him, and he <laughs> still was saying that he just came to meet up with the president, which was Nestor de la Torre, and now he's no longer the president. And, and, and all this craziness because we see that. It looks that Nestor de la Torre didn't have any clue that this was happening. This all happened behind his back, and it was all, you know, orchestrated by Vergara and, and Cigueras, which is something has to do with Omni Life, right, Tom, or, if I understand correctly? Yeah, I mean, this is absolutely bizarre. I mean, the, the first thing that sprung to mind was Club de Cuervos. I mean, this, the, this soap opera that every, <laughs> everybody in Mexico is talking about it. I'm sure people in the United States are as well, and it's this fictional... Northern club from northern Mexico, who, who's um, the father dies and the son takes over, and he's completely unprepared to take over a, a soccer club, and you know he does all these crazy, crazy decisions, and and they're absolutely just come out of nowhere, and then you know <laughs> that's the basic plot of of Club de Cuervos and and at Chivas right now, it's just things are just coming from absolutely nowhere at us. Um, yeah, it's 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 bizarre. I mean. There's just so much to talk about with it, though. It's like, I mean, just the way this all developed for me was just an absolute farce. I mean, the way you know, it's so unprofessional. You get, um, you've got a manager in place, and then another guy arrives in your city and talks to the press. You know, it's just, it's just a complete disaster from a PR point of view, and it's not morally very right. And then, and then you get, you know, you've got Chivas, the club, and then you've got Omni Life, and then you've got all these decisions coming from Omni Life, like, like uh, Naib was saying there without Nestor de la Torre, who's also out. So what's going on? Who's got control? Then you've got the divorce, the Vergara and Helica Fuentes divorce mixed in there. Who knows how that's influencing things? <laughs> we just don't know. Um, I mean, all these bizarre things are happening. Chivas have, have sent out, like, just two tweets today. Um, you know, there's a rumor going around that the press department aren't controlling things, aren't controlling the press now, the OmniLife people have come over there. So there's like it's almost like a revolt. I mean, Karina Herrera, who's a friend of mine in Guadalajara, who, who's got really, really good mm -hmm. contacts with the club, she's saying that you know the players were very close to convincing Bagada to let Chepo stay. 
I mean, what on earth is going on here? And and I think amidst all of this, you've got you know I, I know I made the joke before about Cuevas and Club de Cuevas, and you know it's funny, but at the end of the day, Chivas have got real fans and real people who really <laughs> love the club and have loved them since they were you know very small, and it's it's sad for for all those people to see what you know a great institution just be be running this way. It really is. It's very sad, especially you know being with the you know, it's always the most popular team uh, for Mexico. But uh, just listening to you, listening to the I mean, watching the tweets kind of go by and the news kind of go by, you just kind of don't believe it. Uh, but at the same time, you're not surprised. Uh, it is Vergara, you know, institution. But um, I'll talk to you guys. Kind of of I mean, is it warranted? I mean, I know that uh, we we fire coach like Noah, especially Vergara, especially how many coaches that it's had uh, given the injuries. Given, uh, I know uh, Jolie was was tweeting about. Uh, if you don't know him, he's one of the writers from Next Source. You know, was tweeting on how many home games they've had compared to other teams. The injuries. I mean, did you, is it really a time to fire the coach right now, or do you think that it was Vergara another time you know, taking a tantrum and not sticking with at least the proceso uh, and and sticking it out? I mean, with the players. I mean, for me, I think it's an absolute joke. I honestly, do I feel? You know, quite strongly, but it's like it's just a joke that that this decision has been made. It's like, yeah, all right, Chivas haven't had a great start to the season, but like you know, Jolie was saying, they've had three home games. They won two of those, um, and and they played some very difficult away games. I mean, it's not easy to go to Tijuana with the artificial surface. It's never easy to go to Toluca with the altitude there, and you know they didn't get like outplayed. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, I think. Chepo's got like 44 points, I think it is, from his 34 games in charge since taking over last October, which isn't relegation form. I think it's 1.29 points per game, which puts him in 13th place in the current uh, relegation table. So, you know, whatever's, wherever Chivas are right now isn't Chepo de los Torres' fault, and it's not Nestor de los Torres' fault either. Wherever Chivas is now is because of this systematic hiring and firing of people without a real focused idea from up top on how this club is going to get forward, go move forward. And it's not easy with Chivas because all Mexican players, their options are limited in terms of who they can bring in. But there's a way of doing it. And, and for me, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, this isn't how you run a club. This is almost the exact opposite of how you run a club. And you can see that with players trying to convince the owner to keep a manager. I mean, what what is that? <laughs> it's It's... Like I said, it's it's madness. It's madness, uh, in in what in what we're seeing there. But uh, life here, if you're just joining us, uh, we were we, we started off the show, not even introductions, going into the Chivas talk. Um, Tom Marshall, uh, the, you know, there in Guadalajara, giving us the the news and and that he's seeing from his sources, you know, of uh, of the locker room, even talks of coming uh, Chepo coming back. So we'll see. You know, nothing is surprising what's yeah. going on. But. The, the other thing that I heard, and this is completely unofficial, and it is only rumor. <clears throat> Is that they didn't actually know how much the um, the clause was to cut to fire Chepo, so <laughs> they actually had all this sorted out, and then they were like, "Oh, wait up! Literally millions of dollars to get rid of Chepo de la Torre," and that that caused a lot of what went on today with the you know not knowing and what's going on and how and then the negotiation with with Chepo, no doubt to to come to an agreement. So I mean, it's just everything that's coming out of the club right now just smacks of just completely badly organized place to be and yeah it's not it's not good yeah and then in all of this in all of this you have a, a, an Argentinian coach who's coaching for the first time in Liga MX and we know all the complications it takes for new foreign coaches to kind of understand what Mexican football is all about you know the the the, the way that the last eight teams make the playoffs you now we see with for example in León with Juan Antonio Pisi Antonio Pisi played at least in Toluca for, for during his playing years, but Almeida at least doesn't Almeida doesn't have that. And you know how much it took uh, PC to kind of get used to the league. I'm sorry. Well, Almeida will have to go through the same process. Almeida got River. I mean, what? I know that you know at his relegation and stuff, but uh, Almeida really that great of a coach? Was it, we don't know. Uh, Anfield? He's 41 years old. He's you know <laughs> he's, he's he's got River promoted from. Argentina's second division, but let's that, be honest, that you, you should, they, a lot of the players stayed. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't, I don't see this coach coming. Oh, coming out of promotion, you know, a Matosas or something but like then, that. But it's then when weird. he went to the first division, when he went to the first division, he didn't do very well. Now with Banfield, he got the promotion, 
And then I think he did quite well in the first division. Well, he did okay. But I mean, is that enough experience? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see him being as a. I, I, I don't know where that's coming from. And, it's, and is it Tom? I mean, is it pretty sure that he's going to be the coach? Yeah, I mean, until it's absolutely confirmed with Chivas, I mean, you really don't know. And yeah. and the, the rumors coming out as well are that you know the players aren't really happy with him, because why would they be at this point? I mean, is he, I mean the system that he played as, plays as well is so different from that of Chepo de la Torre. I mean, it's it's another shake up, and 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 I know we're talking mainly about coaches here, but let's not. Nestor de la Torre, he did everything in that club. Yeah. When he came on board last October, the agreement was he's going to run the club. Vergara's not going to do anything. He's going to run the club. He's going to go to Vergara and say, right, I want this player, this player, this player. What? what how much money have we got? And that was that was the deal. Now. For him to go now, it begs the question, not just from a coaching point of view with uh, Almeida, but who's going to be running the club day to day? I mean, what's going on here? Uh, really, I mean, I know Ramon Morales is going to take over the team for for, Tuesday, for, for the Tuesday game against Morelli in the cup, but... Paco Palencia is back. This is another project. It's another project for Chivas. <laughs> Yeah, it's starting all over again. It's just, it, it, it's just, it's just madness. And uh, get, well, let's have it up. They swing from a foreign uh, manager sure. to domestic, foreign to domestic, and it just for me that's the that's the key uh, kind of point where 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 an institution doesn't know what they're doing in in football when they go from a foreign manager to, to domestic, foreign domestic. The foreigner doesn't work. They're like, right, we need a domestic that understands it, and then like, oh, the domestic doesn't really work. Let's try something new so we can advance. Then they go foreign, and Chivas have done that consistently consistently since Vigaro was in charge with obviously the big. The big one, Johan Cruyff, who came in and Vergara again, Club de Cuevas. Club de Cuevas, they say, yeah, we're going to make, um, we're going to make Cuevas the Real Madrid of America Latina. And then Vergara, when Johan Cruyff comes in, he goes, yeah, we're going to make Chivas better than Barcelona. I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, this is just a farce. Well, that was a. Uh... Interesting, especially with the news coming in. Well, let's have an actual intro, guys. Uh, welcome to the Mexican Soccer Show, aside from what's happening with Chivas. Uh, Tom, uh, I know you had took a little break uh, from there on after the game. I got a chance to, to go. I think you were at the Chivas game over there in, uh, uh, in Tijuana. Naive, uh, back now in Texas, uh, d uh, tweeting away. And uh, obviously, uh, enjoy all your articles. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about Europeos and Naive. But uh, as far as uh, today's show, we'll be uh, you know touching up a little bit on Argentina. We'll go back to the Chivas talking Liga MX. Uh, but at the same time, we'll go. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our reactions with the Argentina game, uh, especially last week, uh, which was an amazing game. I got to uh, witness there at uh, AT&T Stadium with Tom. And then also uh, touch a little bit on Europeos, like we said with Naib. Uh, Champions League starting for a lot of them, uh, yes. for all of them that are that are playing. And then obviously, uh, I've just kind of finished with Liga MX. But this is a Mexican soccer show on the chat right now. Lots and lots of going on. Ivan Fernandez, Joel, uh, having a conversation about Chivas. Vergara should sell the team. You're the one, uh, Ramoncito, the interim tomorrow. So there's a lot. And we have a special guest from uh, two. To uh, 20,000 miles up in the air, I don't even know if that's correct, Mr. Cesar Hernandez is joining us on a flight uh, from uh, the, from New York, I think, so it should be uh, should be kind of fun, um, the, uh, the conversation, he is tweeting away, he is talking about, so ask him any questions on the chat, and uh, we'll see what, what's going on, but uh, other than that, Tom, how are you? Whew, not bad, yeah, I mean, <laughs> just a bit of a hectic day with, with everything going on at Chivas, and <laughs> one minute there's some information coming out about this, one the next, and then, you know, I don't know. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not the easiest club to cover, I can tell you. <laughs> oh, is that Naib? Well, good. How I mean, you, I think sir? um, good, good. We saw Tom. Uh, I think uh, for the Europeos it was interesting seeing Tecatito's debut. Uh, I think uh, that was um quite quite a quite special in a way that he. Scored two goals and and now he's gonna play in Champions League against Dinamo de Kiev on um, on Wednesday. That's that's when it's scheduled. And then also Chicharito debut in the Bundesliga. I mean, not as spectacular of a debut as Tegatito, but but you know, new leagues for, for these two players. Yeah, not bad, not not bad about. It. Let's go ahead and talk about Argentina uh, really quick. Get your thoughts, uh, Tom. Uh, we got to see you on TV. Congratulations once again. Looking great. Uh, having some uh, obviously there with Fernando Palomo. 
and Alejandro Moreno that are on ESPN. Uh, definitely tune in uh, to some of the games. Uh, I know Tom gets a chance to be up there and represents the Mexican soccer show. So awesome, <laughs> awesome times. Uh, Tom, uh, just your reaction. Great game, uh, at least in my point of view. I thought, you know, before the, if the game started, a tie, I'll sign it. The fact that Mexico went in there, played offensive, so many spaces that Argentina kind of gave them. Uh, two sides to the story, Mexico playing uh, well, and was this Argentina going, oh, man, we're about to lose, let's turn it up. And uh, the caliber of Argentina in the last seven minutes showed and they were able to tie. Or was this a game where Argentina was kind of... Um, you know, dumbfounded the fact that that uh, Mexico was doing so well, so strict, so to the discipline there from from the team. So, Tom, I'll go to you. You were there. You saw it. Tell us uh, what side is it? Is it Mexico having a great game, or Argentina not really caring because of the field, because of the players, and then finally turning it up after those six changes and then six minutes in there? The, it's the same old story. Uh, so they they tie us up and then Yamerito once again. I think I think Mexico deserves a lot of credit. For the way they played, more than anything, I think that you know, the I think Mexico had more to play for because this was the last game before the the big game against the United States. So I think there was greater intensity about Mexico. But I mean, I thought for me personally, I thought that game was a reminder. Uh, w listen, we've had the, all this summer with the Mexican national team. You know, we've we've been to quite a few games, and let's be honest, it's been underwhelming. Yeah, the Gold Cup, Mexico won the Gold Cup, which was obviously great for. For Mexico fans, but then after that, you know, Miguel Herrera gets fired, and then nobody knows who's coming in, and then Ferretti comes in, and then they draw 3 3 against Trinidad Tobago and didn't really look very good at all. And then finally, they play Argentina, and everybody's predicting, including myself, I admit, you know, a defeat for Mexico, and they yeah. give us a reminder, the players more than anybody, of, of what Mexican football is all about. And when I say that, I mean the intensity of the pressing. In turn, you know, Chicharito and Raúl Jiménez, I thought, were excellent in in stopping Argentina playing out the back. You know, the the work rate of the midfield trio there, um, and the and the technique, and I thought they suffocated Argentina and stopped them playing to a large degree. And the key to all that, you know, is not just stopping them playing, but on the counter, on the break, the Mexico caused a lot of problems. And and you know, they could have scored a, you know, Chicharito should have scored a, at least one more goal, shouldn't he, really? So, you know, it's a, I thought it was an excellent performance by Mexico. And the only thing I'd point out is that when teams give Mexico space to play like Argentina did and to attack and get in behind them and, and give the likes of Guardado and Herrera, you know, you know space in front of them, space to put, take the head up and have a look, pick out the passes, then they're, they're a very good team. Uh, the problem I think Mexico has is when teams kind of sit back, they play, you know, a bank of four, a bank of five, or a bank of five, bank of four, with one striker and they just sit back, they reduce the space between the lines and they don't let them play. And and that's CONCACAF and, and that's why Mexico have only won 10 of the last 29 games against CONCACAF opposition. So yeah, excellent stuff from Mexico, um, but still that little thing with, with CONCACAF, it didn't, it's not resolved that problem that the team has. No, definitely. Uh, Naive, uh, to you, uh, you know, Tuca Ferretti didn't have, he had two days to train, especially with the players. Uh, we saw a uh, backline of five, which uh, it was kind of warranted. It was coming out. Uh, people were tweeting it out, looking what we were seeing in practice. Uh, did you see Tuca's hand in this team? Or was this, uh, you know, regurgitated, uh, <laughs> same old 5-3-2, Bandas, Layun, you know, on the right, Jimenez on the left, uh, coming overlapping. But uh, what are your thoughts in, in that if Piojo was, was coaching this, this team against Argentina, it would have done the same? You know, it's a good question uh, if it was if Tuca's hand was already, you know, included into this whole deal. And and in a certain extent, I think the what what Tuca provides is a lot of order, you know, especially with his teams really all of the lines kind of are on the same page. And you see it with Tigres and I think you saw it with El Tri in these games. But we did see a touch of Pio Herrera. The, the first 75 minutes, because I think the last 15 minutes were a little bit chaotic because of the substitutions. You know, I think once Gallito left the pitch, you know, El Tri suffered, and also Rafa Marquez, of course, was another big substitution towards the end of the match. Um, but that organization that we saw the first 75 minutes with the midfielders and, and the pressing and, and, and so forth, and that could have been... I, I kind of remember the game against Croatia in the World Cup. You know, it was kind of the similar thing. Croatia has a great midfield with Rakitic, Modric, and Perisic, and it's kind of resembling of what Argentina had available with, with Gago and Mascherano 
and the other one right now doesn't come to my mind, but it, it's that similar. It, it's teams that don't close, um, don't put, a, don't park the bus basically against Mexico. It's teams that actually play as well, and that's where El Tri was good. I think if there's a, 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 a an asterisk or that I would put in the game is is the finishing from the forwards. You no, know, because I think Chicharito and Raúl Jiménez played excellent. I think, but that finishing, I saw a better finishing rate from uh, Hector Herrera than perhaps. Chicharito and Raúl Jiménez, and Raúl Jiménez and Chicharito will have to put those those goals in when it comes to the October 10th game. Yeah, I think I think for that as well. I mean, think for both players, you look at how much they've played recently, and I think for Raúl Jiménez, what was it his first first start since the Copa América, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and, and for Chicharito, his first start since before the before the Gold Cup in an official game, anyway. So you know. I thought, yeah, I thought the partnership worked well, but the key now between now and this, uh, the game against the United States, is that is that both of them are getting minutes, and and I think even more importantly, banging a few goals in to get to get that confidence back. Uh, uh, to you guys, um, you know, the, you know, Mexico playing well for me. Looking at the order, and you said it, naive, having that order, having that discipline. I haven't seen Mexico play like that since the World Cup. I haven't seen uh, a quality 75 minutes, 80 minutes from them, and much to attribute to the World Cup, you know, line. I mean that 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 Croatia game, your know, Rafa Marquez, uh, Gallito, have you know having in there. Uh, I just as soon as they left, just like you said, you know, uh, it, it was gone, and the two goals came out. Granted, there was a lot of substitution. <laughs> you know, when whenever you're about to, when, whenever Argentina changes four. For substitution, it changes everything in one. Well, I think I was looking at trying to find and decipher the numbers of who was coming in or not. But at the same time, I liked I like what I see, and I and I can see that it, that that it was you know took a took his hand maybe maybe helping what obviously what what Piojo had, but at the same time the order was there, the discipline was there, um, and uh, it was able to very very entertaining. Uh, I, once again, AT and T Stadium, an amazing venue. Uh, every yeah. every goal or every opportunity, just I mean, you would get goosebumps for how many people that are there. But uh, overall, well, there. I, I think that I think that one key point with the uh, Tuca Ferretti that's a bit overlooked. Like I, I've been to quite a few his press conferences now, and he almost always says. You know, he's he's not looking for tactics or or kind of a, a tactical system. The key for him is balance, and and he and he's keep he's kept stressing that he's not coming yeah. in there to absolutely change this team around. What he's saying is he's got he wants to build on the base that's already there. So he wants to build on those partnerships all over the field. For example, in the midfield, no, with Gallito, Herrera, and Guardado, he wants to build on that and 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 add his little touches here and there. And I think that's really important. I think um, I think it looked good in the Argentina game what what he tried to do. And I'm I'm, I'm I think that against the United States it's got to be that formation. I don't know what don't know what you two think. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't like Guardado coming in and playing in that mid role. I felt like it's not for him the defensive mid role kind of moving in there. Torres Nilo uh, when when he when he subbed the minute and then obviously Gallito. I don't know what he was trying to do. I'm moving him kind of towards forward. I think that same formation that's there. And, and it works. I've said this before. I love Jonathan Dos Santos, but I really feel Herrera uh, and uh, Guardado. Guardado. I feel those are the best mid that, that we have. As much think, as having Jonathan Dos Santos. I think, I think uh, right now the, the, the little, the small associations. I think that Rafa Gallito association, it's the key, mm -hmm. basically. That's what makes this team special because... They were winners. They, they understand. Yeah, they were the campeones with León. Yeah. And I think that's that's one of the associations to keep an eye on. And and probably is the reason why Gallito's going to start against the U.S. because he's a, he does well with playing alongside um, Rafa Márquez. The question that I will put on the table right now is, what if Tecatito keeps scoring goals in Portugal and scores this week in Champions League? Does he, and, and consider he didn't even come to these games because of the passport issues and, and so forth, but it's it's a question that I've been it's been in my head several days. This mm -hmm. Tecatito that kind of provides that spark, you know, it's it's a better version than Giovanni dos Santos, I'd say right now, Tecatito Corona, and, and I think it will be an important player to have. I don't know what you guys think about that. <laughs> uh, drama on, the, on that statement right there, uh, Tom. We saw it on the on the uh, on the press conference when he with Tuca Ferretti was pretty upset about about Tecatito not coming. Yeah. 
No, yeah, he's a big player, and he's gonna, he's a big player now, and he's going to be a massive player for Mexico in the future. Being the most exciting young Mexico player out there right now, uh, I think he's going to find it struggle to break into the starting eleven though mm-hmm. for that US game. One because he wasn't there, and t- yeah. and two there's not much time, and three um, where does he play in a five three two? And I think that's Tecatito's problem. That's Aquino's problem in a five three two. You know, if you if you're playing two out and out wingers, then I think yeah. They've got a good in chance, 20, but in 20, I don't think I, I don't think you can put that nine. Yeah, that, I mean, can play there, but do, does he provide? And I don't and I don't think he does, <laughs> but I don't think Ferretti will, will trust him to 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 press and to to kind of you know mm-hmm. try and put the defense off the way that Chicharito and Raúl Jiménez did. I think we saw exactly what he was looking for with those two strikers, and I don't think Tecatito necessarily got that. Plus, he didn't have that. You know, Raul Jimenez, one thing that impressed me was when he had his back to goal. Yeah. I thought he was a real asset, and I think it's something that Mexico hasn't had for a while. I thought Oribe Peralta kind of did that okay, but I think... No, that, Raul Jimenez brings it. He brings it, he, and it's a physical presence, and I was impressed with him. And I think that you could see the difference with that year in Spain. Well, it's going to uh, be a very different game, I mean, against the U.S. We're not going to see the Argentina spaces that they gave us. We're not going to see all that. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe... Maybe Tecadito will be the answer when it's a 0-0 at halftime and, you know, Raul Jimenez bobbing it over to Chicharito because you're not, you know, we're not doing the contragolpe. We're, we have to have a little bit more possession. We're going to have to see kind of go over the line. Trent and Tobago it was that 4-4-2 formation going over. So, I'll be, I'll be, I want to see what, you know, how, uh, you know, Tuca's going to take the U.S. game because Klinsman's going to do what Klinsman does against Mexico. He's going to wait for it, wait for those mistakes, and and play that game. He's He hasn't lost against them, and he has a number. But uh, I, I don't know why, as much as I was a big fan of Tuca, but I feel like Tuca can really beat this U.S. team and not giving them, you know, that, that soberbia, like we're going to control the tempo and, and we're going to attack in, in, in the way that it is. And, and They'll be okay counterattacking and waiting for their mistakes too. Not necessarily giving them the possession, but not being so eager of taking it and and using you know seven, eighteen passes to get to the middle. Yeah, okay. the, the fullbacks. <laughs> you no, know? the fullbacks also I think will be really important. And I was really impressed with Israel Jimenez mm-hmm. during these two games in Trini- against Trinidad and against Argentina. He connected well um, over there in the right. And, 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 you know, Paula Hilar didn't play this game. So does that mean that Israel Jimenez is going to be the starter? You know, and, and Layun, I don't know about Layun because I, I, he's just been so distorted with his position in the last year or so, you know, playing as a midfielder. It doesn't doesn't give that, you know, left-back position kind of authority or, or solidness that Torres Nilo gives. You know, and I think that that's another doubt in my mind right now. Uh, Who is going to be the fullback? Wasn't it his pass against Sector Herrera? Oh well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that like, like was no, but Layun wasn't doing anything when he went with that with the formation of five. It wasn't Torres Nilo came up, pushed Layun up forward more, and was able to to have a little more connection towards the end. Layun did, but on that simple five, Layun really didn't do anything. It was that same Layun when we saw his crosses kind of going over and over. But as soon as Torres Nilo came in, moved them up a little bit more, and that was Tuca right there. Right there. The only thing I didn't like, I didn't like how Guardado was kind of going towards in the middle a little bit more and, and took that defensive mid. Uh, and and I didn't think he's, I don't think he's that type of player for it. But other than that, uh, you know, good, good, good for Tuca in what we saw. But yeah, important, no, important yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, Tom, uh, are we ready for the U.S.? Um, I think the the U.S. aren't ready for Mexico. <laughs> That's probably the best way to put it. You know, I think that uh, the U.S. are in in a really uh, bad place right now. I mean, we've seen some genuine criticism now from the from the U.S. media towards Jurgen Klinsmann and the United States team. Uh, they're coming off the back of that heavy defeat against Brazil, where they didn't show much, and they're coming off the back of the uh, the Gold Cup, where they lost against Jamaica and finished fourth. I mean, that 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 is a disaster. If that would have happened to Mexico, then you know, well. The manager would have changed, but he changed anyways. <laughs> yeah. uh, we would have, we would not have had a manager in, in, if if we couldn't make it to the final after that after that gold cup. Let's be but honest. But I mean, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I think, I think Duke. The best thing about Duke is what I said that he's going to keep that base of the team and what what you see is what you're going to get. Can they beat the United States? I don't think there's much difference. I think Mexico player for player probably slightly the better team, but I honestly don't think there's much in it. 
Um, so I it's, it's, rivalry games. It's who, it's who performs on the day, um, and and if Uka can come up with a solution, I mean, you know, it's six games now. Klinsman is unbeaten against the, against Mexico, and you know, it's it's not greatly different each game. You know what I mean? Apart from that, maybe that two two one against uh, with Miguel oh. Herrera in Phoenix. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, most of them are the same. I mean, the United States sit back, they work hard, they graft, and, and Mexico kind of just kind of <laughs> wear themselves out. And I think that Tuca, like what you said there, we saw it's like, I don't know, I think Mexico got to be really patient. I don't think they've got to kind of ignore the crowd, even though it's going to be a pro-Mexico crowd. And they've just got to keep the ball, they've got to wait for the passes, they've got good enough players to pick them out, and to not leave too much space at the back, because... On the counter attack, that's how a lot of teams, especially CONCACAF teams, have done Mexico damage. They know that in the transition, when they give up play, they can hit Mexico hard, and a lot of the time, Mexico are all over the place because because they push so many people forward ahead of the ball. Exactly. Naive uh, question, especially you know, uh, on your opinion, every you know, the question before the camp, before the game was Gio, Jonathan, and Ochoa. Do you think Tuca's gonna call any of them to to these games, or is there any chance? I think there's a slight hope, I'd say, a slight hope, and especially <laughs> especially with uh, with the Dos Santos brothers, I think. You know, because, you know, what if Ormar Gonzalez plays, uh, starts for the U.S.? You know, you have that advantage with Giovanni, who trains every day against him, you know, in the Inter Esquadra, so they call it. And that could be an advantage in, in going into the second half if the game is tighter or whatnot. But, you know, if, if he didn't call him in this game and he was already, Tuca was pretty obvious about it. It's like sometimes you're going to agree with my decision, sometimes you're not going to agree with my decision. Yeah. You know, I, th I think um, I'd say there's like a 25 or a 15% chance uh, <laughs> to say I still want to give it somewhere, but it's really low. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're one, if Mexico 1 0 down, 20 minutes left. I mean, you want Giovanni on there, don't you? You know, you want Tecatito Corona's options. Um, Carlos Vela. So, yeah. Even Bella will be an option. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have a question for you guys. Has, too many Carlos options. Vela, has Carlos Vela ever lost against the U.S.? I don't know. I don't know. Question for you guys out there on on, uh, on the chat to have some chance. Uh, Cesar, if you're on the flight, has uh, I was trying to think about this, but I don't I don't think Carlos Vela has lost against the U.S. Just, just throwing it out there. Maybe, maybe they have. That. Yeah, so. no, but it's it's interesting what's going on with Vela as well. I mean, where does he fit in now after Chicharito <laughs> and uh, you know, is it is he like? I mean, I mean, Real Sociedad haven't scored in three games. Yeah, yeah, they have zero goals so far in the season. And 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 Vela's the big player. He's the main guy up front, charged with getting the goals. He's the you know the highest paid player and you know the the star of the team. And you know he's not done it. I mean, I don't know. It's it's a bit of a worry. Um, and I think I think with Tuca at the end of the day, I think he knows that you know if you've got Tecatito, you've got Villa. I mean, how many more of those kind of players do you want? And I think that's one of the things with Giovanni. But I tend to think that I think I tend to think he'll he'll call up Giovanni. I mean, I don't know why he wouldn't. You know what I mean? I don't know why if you're a temporary manager, you're only in charge. <laughs> you're only in charge for a couple of games. Your big games against the United States. I mean. You want that option on the bench. What happens if you want to change formations? Or you know what I mean? There's different scenarios where you want your best players. I mean, full respect to um, Henry Martin, but I mean, come on. He yeah. only made his debut a, a little over a year ago. He's not made a massive impact on the Liga MX. Like you know, he's 22 year old. He's a decent player, but you know, that's one for the future. That's one that to keep your eye on over the next couple of years. Giovanni is on form. He's like the only Mexican striker scoring goals. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> he walked by the press zone, and I'm like, "Who is that guy?" <laughs> I totally forgot about Eddie Martin just walking by the in, in the zone. You know, we saw that was too kind. Anyway, I, I heard. Uh, I, heard I heard you failed to interview Messi. That was really. I was really disappointed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All we were waiting for is to have a Mexican soccer show exclusive to have Messi on, and you know when a, you know when a guy has bodyguards for the press, you know he's a big deal. Like. Here's everybody. There's a there's there's a fence. Everybody already passed by. Devis, everyone, everyone's waiting for Messi, and six guys are around. Him, five, six guys are around him, and we actually had a chance because the uh, Zoom and uh, Concacaf guys were gonna stop him for anyone in English, and nope, <laughs> not even Zoom can get Messi. 
Don can get messy. But uh, fun, fun, fun times there at the uh, at, at the game. Uh, last thoughts about Mexico on um, the game's approaching. I mean, if you think about it, uh, this week should probably already look at the call-ups uh, against the Europeos. If, they, if he hasn't done so already. So I think we're going to start seeing, I think it's uh, 21 days, I think we're going to start seeing any of those leaked, uh, you know, teams. But that doesn't mean anything because Jonathan Dos Santos was, you know, ready to go, all oh, happy because he got another, but who knows what's going to happen. Uh, I think Tuca finally has a say on which a Europeos to come and go. From what I heard also, Tecatito having some passport problems too. If you, I don't remember, if you remember that in the press zone, he did mention something about passport. Uh, so hopefully everything gets straight now, but interesting to see. Well, we should start seeing in the next week what Europeos are coming, um, and then so that would be the big Jonathan Dos Santos. Or, I don't, I don't think Memo Choa at all will probably have a chance, and then uh, pretty soon a call up in about in a couple of weeks. And very interesting question uh, that somebody asked here at the press zone: Were uh, is Tuca going to ask for a little bit more time with uh, with you know with the home crowd, with the home players? Uh, maybe have those. Those, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of mini camp, but at the same time, I feel like all yeah. of the players are Europeos that he's fielding at least, you know, uh, a good portion of them. So I don't think that's true. But well, uh, yeah. Plus, I mean, I know we're building up this game up a lot, but it's only for the Confederations Cup. I mean, I know it's. Yeah. I mean, it's not like <laughs> you're going to make the World Cup or not. It's like it's the Confederations Cup. It's a big deal, yeah, but it's not like. Massive, is it? <laughs> <Not only laughs> you know my stuff. It's huge. We don't huge make game. it. Huge game. Huge game. Go for Medic. Well, we're right now, we're right now we, we got to figure out who the new coach is going to be. That's, that's, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. There's not even a coach because I mean, Tupac, then. Yeah. It's the an interim. Coming up. No, well, Chepo de la Torre is available. <laughs> Miguel Herrera is still, uh, still, still about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Know? And uh, Tom's yes, just telling me that somebody. On the chat said Miguel Herrera ready for Chivas. Miguel Herrera for Chivas. I mean that would be that would be interesting actually, but I don't think it's going to happen. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that for the new Mexico coach, the one the name that's coming out is Osorio. I mean, I've not oh, seen any awesome. other names over the Another last five, ten days. Done? I don't know, but the thing is, this is the thing. It's like if you treat managers so badly, like Chivas have with Chepo, and <laughs> like you know Mexico have with Vucetic, then. At Tom. some point, somebody draws a line in the sand and says, "You know what? I don't want those kind of Tom, jobs." The, the, if anything, the FMF treats, you know, coaches. I think pretty. I mean, they pay them a lot. I, I'm pretty sure they're they're pretty well yeah. off. All of them running with that money that they have. So, uh, but uh, let's switch well, it I mean, off. But what I'm saying is, no, no serious. What serious coaches right now would want that job? Where does it lead you to? You know what I mean? What manager has gone from Mexico national team to a greater job? If it almost apart from Aguirre. It's been the absolute pinnacle, and all they've done from since then is gone downhill. You know, they've <laughs> never reached that height, and it's like it's a worry, and and it, and it and it comes with respect. And I don't think a lot of these people making decisions these days in Mexico football uh, have respect for people who are actually working in it. Honestly, it's like with Chivas, what a lack of respect that is to somebody who's who's won your institution, the la your last title. You treat him like that. You know what I mean? You make him come into training, get his training gear on, and go out. You know I mean, it's just a joke. And it's same with Vucetti, it's same with Mexico, it's like, it's not good, I don't know, it's not good. Anyways, <laughs> rant over, rant over. Rant <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's switch it up over to uh, Naive and the Europeos, uh, big season, a uh, record number of, um, of players, I think, in the Champions League for Mexican for, for a year, but Naive, tell us, what do we need to know, who do we need to watch for all of us that are coming back from the Mexican national team and all the games, getting ready to go with the Europeos. El Tri, you know, uh, looked like uh, a lot of the players debuted on Saturday. Miguel Layun uh, uh, starting, also Tecatito scoring, Chicharito with uh, Bayer Leverkusen, you know, uh, having at least a lookout. But tell us, Naive, this week, important on the Mexicans abroad and also, you know, even, uh, even Gio, what's going on, especially with the uh, Champions League. Take it away. Yeah, definitely. Um, tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, Benfica Astana. That's uh, a game where uh, Raul Jimenez can get some minutes. He already has had several and already scored a goal as well. Um, then uh, PSV and Manchester United. That that will be interesting, you know, seeing um, Louis Van Gaal go back to the Netherlands. Memphis Depay is in Manchester United and now, um, you know, used to play for PSV. And of course, Hector Moreno and Andres Guardado, you know, kind of 
see if they can get a little, give a scare to Manchester United in honor of uh, Chicharito, you know, of the treatment he received, <laughs> he received there in, uh, in United. Uh, on Wednesday, you have Bayer Leverkusen against Bate Borisov. That could be, I don't know if it could be a start for Chicharito, but, you know, it, it's a possibility there. Uh, and also Dinamo de Kiev versus FC Porto, uh, also on Wednesday. And and also you can say Olympiacos, Bayern Munich, and that Pulido is involved, but I think Pulido... Who's done? Adios, you know, I think he has to come back to Monterrey because it looks like uh, he hasn't had a single minute in Olympiacos, and Olympiacos is not going to risk it, you know, because the Court of Arbitration for Sport already gave their statement to... Uh, their official mm -hmm. statement to Tigres. Tigres already made it official, and it looks like there is a contract, you know, so... Uh, that's going to be something to follow in the next weeks. Another another telenovela. Oh, in my Mexican goodness. Football. Like, did, did Pulido <laughs> just forget to sign? That he signed? He, he, like, he was drunk and he signed it and he comes back. You know what? I never signed it. Yeah, you're right. I never signed it. Like, Dupre was 100% sure talking about it. Uh, we were there in the press conference when somebody told me. He didn't even know that they ruled it for, for, for Tigres. And Tuca's like, oh, really? Well, all right. I knew it. Like, he was just so calm. I knew it. Of course. I mean, you know, pues, como? Si? I mean, sabia? I mean, he was just a circus, Tom. It's just a circus. And then on uh, Thursday, Jonathan plays. So I think he has a good shot of starting, um, you know, because in the in the weekend against Granada, he didn't get a single minute. But Marcelino Garcia Toral already said that there's a possibility uh, to give the bench minutes in this game in the Europa League. It would be interesting to see where Jonathan plays this, a right midfielder or a uh, defensive midfielder. We'll see um, what happens there. And, um, and, and Reyes and, and Carlos Vela are getting 90-90 minutes, both of them in Real Sociedad. The, the unfortunate thing is that in Real Sociedad, they're, they're not playing the best football at the moment. I just love the understated way you said that, like not playing the best football. <laughs> Was it 270 minutes without scoring a goal? <laughs> good, old, good old David Moyes. Love how he's taken on the <laughs> he's taken to La Liga. It's funny because I saw David Moyes after the game um, in Sevilla against Betis, and he looked really calm. Like it was like, yeah, yeah, we we played uh we played the good last 70 minutes. The first 25 minutes were bad. That's what David Moyes said. Um, but you know, calm as water. You know, he looks like he he's not scared of losing his job in San Sebastian. <laughs> David as long Moyes as he's playing played. Reyes, as long as he's playing Reyes, <laughs> he's <we're> all right. <laughs> David Moyes, man, he's happy as he can be, right, Tom? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it can't be like being at United, can it? I mean, he must yeah. be. <laughs> the pressure is just so. And obviously, it's a decent-sized club, but nothing like nothing like United or, or anything like that. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> Let's uh, well, it's a short a short uh, show today for us, but uh, Liga MX uh, coming back over oh you know over the weekend, but um, games to look forward to in this week nine, uh, week ten, no week nine, right? Yeah, in week nine. Um, and what we're seeing Veracruz, Puebla, Cruz Azul, Pumas, León, Club Tijuana, I think would be a good game. León, all of a sudden just just gets trashed. The six uh, What's going on? I don't understand. I don't know what's going on, not just with Leon, but the whole league. It's just gone crazy. The amount of <laughs> it goals. went from like amazing weeks, and all of a sudden, this happened. You know, Pumas is the best defense and the best offense. Pumas and the super leader. Yeah, Pumas. I mean, I mean, who would have thought? Especially coming back from down. Toluca, Chiapas. You know, La Volpe, Chiapas. Uh, Santos, Atlas, Tigres, Monterrey. Obviously, a huge, huge game. And then. Uh, Monarcas and Club America, continuing what Club America can do, but in yeah. important, important. I think um, I think I pick out Cruz Azul Pumas because it's it's top against bottom there. Uh, Cruz Azul are in last place, believe it or not. So I mean, Sergio Bueno, to be honest, I mean, you know, how much longer can he go on at this club? I mean, one of the big four clubs, and I don't know. I mean, the fans don't like him. The fans aren't showing up to the game. I mean, he's not picking up many points. Um, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like th there's a project there. Where I know, I know, I might sound hypocritical with what I said earlier about about Chivas, but I think with Chivas you had like a project with with Nestor de la Torre and and Chepo, and you could see the youngsters, and whether you like it or not, it it, it had an identity. Um, whereas Cruz Azul, it's just 
I mean, I think he deserves a bit more time, but it wouldn't surprise me, considering what we've seen in the press, considering what we see Cruz Azul fans say, if if they lost that game against Pumas, which is Mexico City derby, and you know Pumas absolutely flying, then if they get rid of him, I mean, Chepo, Chepo's available. <laughs> <laughs> you know? that, that would be just crazy, man. Chepo's available. Now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think he'd be a great manager for Cruz Azul. I don't know, though. I don't know. No, no, because I saw had the injuries. They had Mark Rosas out with an ACL injury for six months. And also, Massa Rodriguez got an in. He injured himself playing uh, football ball, you know, which is just bizarre over there in L3. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, you know, you have there, there's some players like Bellucci who just barely started playing in the league into the seventh week of games because the transfer didn't come in time. You know, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite it's, it's just crazy Cruz Azul with the with the new players they bring in every season. Yeah, it's it's very I mean we see this every year but it's very unpredictable isn't it this this tournament right now. I mean really it's very it's unexpected boomers to the top and then you know Chiapas are in sixth. I mean nobody really expected that and Veracruz yeah, up to seventh. I feel like they always do that. Chiapas always comes out or Veracruz <laughs> always comes out. And then, you know, super leader, have a great, you know, and all of a sudden it starts leveling off in the last five weeks and, like, Monterrey wins, you yeah. know, or, like, yeah. a random Tigres, so you're not random, or Toluca will win, you know, one of those the same winners. I mean, when, yeah. aside from Cholos and Leon, when was the last time, you know, any of the, you know, the usuals that would win, the random, it's, it's, it's such a weird tournament, but then hopefully at the end, you know, the I number think, eight wins again. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think the uh, the other team that's slightly worrying is uh, Dorados. I I watched him live on um, on Saturday against Atlas, and don't know. I'm just not not very impressed with them. I mean, I know the week before they beat Puebla one nil, but before that they lost the last three and conceded ten goals. Um, I don't know. I just think you need a good defense if you're gonna if you're gonna stay up. Um, and I'm not sure it's quite got the quality. I mean, they just keep conceding too many goals and uh, you look at Chivas and you think who's going to save Chivas you know what manager or what sporting director and <laughs> it might well be Dorados <laughs> but it's funny because it's a good point you bring up Tom because Morelia and Puebla started the season off well but slowly, slowly as the season has progressed they slowly dropped the form you know they're yeah. losing games um, and, and that's actually a positive for Chivas so, so Chivas fans who are watching now I mean, the other relegation teams are sucking pretty much at the moment. Morelia, Dorados, and Puebla. Uh, and, oh, that's good. Yes, I mean, if looking at it from that point of view, of course, you know, there's a, it's a, a circus, Chivas, uh, like Cirque de Sule, but, uh, you know, it's it's uh, the other teams are doing bad as well. I just got the Cirque de Sule. Like, I was laughing. <laughs> Oh, guys, well, you know, the circus, I think it's just the drama, the circus. I always I always think of, you know, is there a podcast out there for, you know, the Italian team, the, you know, the English team, Tom, and there's just the drama and the circus of, of what happened with the coaches. I mean, uh, we don't like to call it 3MZ, but it looks like it. we're always in this cheesemess. Or, 3MZ. Oh, 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 we coming up. But, guys, uh, like fun, it. fun show. Uh, Liga yeah. MX from now on, at least uh, a little bit of, uh, of Champions League. I'm sure we're going to keep updating and 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 what's happening with Chicharito, what's happening with uh, with Raul Jimenez. I think I'm excited. I'm excited to see Raul Jimenez at Benfica. I think it suits him perfectly in that league. Um, and then uh, obviously the guys in, in Holland. But other than that, a little break from El Tri for the co next couple of weeks, unless we get some kind of rumors and breaks about the coaching. <laughs> and then after the Mexico game, we have a uh, Panama, and then. I think you know here we, here comes the qualifiers. If you know, interesting during the Mexico match, a lot of lot of news about you know about the Curaçao's, the Jamaica, El Salvador, almost you know keeping it. So it should be interesting in Concacaf. But keep it right here with uh, with the Mexicans hockey show. But guys, Tom, Naive, uh, thank you for jumping on. Uh, for all of you guys that are watching on the YouTube, please subscribe and uh, on Facebook too. We have a Mexican soccer show Facebook page uh, where you can win some tickets. Who knows? Uh, we we're able to hand out some tickets for the Tom met someone at, uh, over there in Salt Lake uh, in his travels, but uh, who knows where we can give out the Mexico soccer show here. But naive last thoughts on Mexico, Europeo. You know what? Any topic. Last topic. Any topic. Uh, the Astros are doing good. The Houston Astros are doing good <laughs> in, the, in the baseball season. <laughs> you know, and, and it's actually good because here in the city, usually the teams don't play so well. 
um, and it's it's good to see uh, the baseball team doing great. Awesome. Well, there you go. If you're from Houston, nice, nice. Tom, uh, any topic? Um, yeah, I don't know much about baseball. <laughs> That's what you're talking about. And I don't know much about American football at all. But, uh, yeah, uh, Champions League, I know about that. I like that. Champions League <laughs> this week, coming back, should be good. And, and, and Anthony Marshall, Anthony Marshall, um, a good a good uh, signing, Tom. Yes, I mean, no better way to... related. No. I think I think maybe maybe going back about hundred generations or something, but <laughs> no, not, we don't look that alike, we so. <laughs> we not all that alike. <laughs> Guys, for me, um, thanks for jumping on. Thanks for following on Twitter. Lots and lots of fun making videos at games and uh, doing those recaps with Tom and interviewing. Uh, uh, all sorts of players, and uh, just having fun. I re we, just from all of us here at the Mexican Sox Show, we really appreciate everyone following uh, and, and helping us out with uh, growing. Hopefully, uh, you know, obviously we keep uh, doing this. Tom, you said something? Pancho Villasami, thanks for the uh, yes. providing the atmosphere yes. for uh, for those recent Mexico games. Definitely uh, can see it's growing. Definitely see it's growing. Yeah, so uh, out. Uh, if you're still not a member of Pancho Villas Army, definitely uh, go in there and uh, I'll plug his uh, the tickets. Only way to get tickets for the Mexico-U.S. game is through Pancho Villas Army. And, uh, you know, they're our friends. They're always helping us out. We're helping them out. So definitely sign up and go to the game. We need as many people as possible, uh, especially at the U.S.-Mexico game there at Pasadena. So thank you so much, Sergio, Guelito over there, and uh, everyone else who was there. Special shout out to Mr. Uh, Afro Xander. His birthday was uh, this weekend. One of our, one of our followers on Twitter is always here with uh, with with uh, Mex Source helping us out in the press and then also uh, here at the Mexican Soccer Show. So that's it from me. Uh, we'll see each other uh, next Monday. If not, if anything, you know, hopefully no more news, crazy news comes out. If uh, we might have to pull a emergency uh, Mexican Soccer Show. Who knows? Bielsa signing up, but maybe that will warrant a show on uh, Thursday. Nice. Uh, definitely, we'll all jump on for a couple hours, and uh, we'll all celebrate. It won't even be a show; it'll just be a little celebration show, and everyone's, you know, Cesar can 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 give us uh, his his beer choice of Bielsa. But Cesar, I know you're on a flight. You're watching us. Thank you for joining the chat, and all of you on the chat. Thank you again. We'll see you all no next week. This has been the Mexican Soccer Show.